welcome again to the Dodcast. I'm your host, Luke Dodson, and I'm talking to Alexander Leong about physical and mental training strategies for an age of decline. So thanks for joining me today, Alex. Well, thank you for having me, Luke. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've been really interested in reading your Substack, um, the the Better Barbarians newsletter. Uh, yes, that's what it's called. Yeah, I'm 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 interested to hear a little bit about how you uh, how you've come to these things. I, I understand that you've got a background in philosophy. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Um, I completed a, an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and my specialty is philosophy of organism or process philosophy, as it is sometimes known. Interesting. Uh, is this anything to do with the process theology of Whitehead, or am I mistaken there? Um, yeah, yeah. So process philosophy is a broader term given to um, the philosophy of organism developed by Henry Bergson mm-hmm. and later on uh, Alfred North Whitehead. Process theology is what people commonly associate with uh, Whitehead. That would be the work of John B. Cobb and people like that. But Whitehead himself never actually thought of his work as theology. He's a mathematician. Right. Interesting. Interesting. And so from there, you've you've been on quite a journey uh, in terms of the the world of ideas. I take it. Um, so so you, when did you when did you finish your studies? Um, in terms of my degree, I finished that in 2015. And in terms of my broader study, my self study, that that is an ongoing process, and I don't expect it to end anytime soon. Yes, yes, I I I um I I, I finished my my sort of undergrad and postgrad back in 2012. So I, I think we're of sort of similar age, aren't we? Kind of, I'm I'm in my sort of early to mid 30s, um, and uh, it, it's it's been quite an interesting decade i think to uh to to come of age really um you know the beginning of the decade uh, we we saw the the really the beginnings of the unraveling i think you know beginning with the uh the the, the financial crash in sort of 2008 um and the you know the the strange things that have been going on in academia since then as well that have kind of filtered out into the rest of the world <laughs> yeah yeah um weird would be would be the one of the i guess the lightest ways to put it <laughs> yes absolutely so for those unfamiliar uh would you like to give a little bit of a a, a sort of uh an intro as to your current uh area of interest is and in, in the things that you cover in your in your blog uh yes i would love to so um for any of you who uh, are interested i write a weekly newsletter on substack called the better barbarians newsletter it is the first time i've actually decided to share my thoughts and my writing with a with a wider audience for many good reasons um, what I am trying to do with it is I'm trying to fill a niche, and I don't know how big this niche is. It's, uh, it's very possible that I'm the only person who might ever be interested in what I'm writing. Um, I don't know. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to um, create a synthesis, if you will, of uh, physical culture and vitalism and that sort of area, physical training, with intellectual pursuits so things like philosophy and um, understanding the world a little bit better um, social observation social commentary and um, all of that so those two come together and the background for that would be preparing people men and women for what i see as the post-industrial world post-industrial civilization which if you're familiar with um, you know most of these theorists of collapse like uh, Dmitry Orlov or John Michael Greer, they've been saying it's coming, they've been saying it's coming, they say it's here. I, I agree, I think it's here. So the question is, how can we create people who are physically and mentally and spiritually prepared to live in a post-industrial world and to grapple with industrial decline? 
that's exactly where my uh, area of interest lies at the moment. Uh, it, it was why it was so interesting and refreshing to uh, to see uh, to see someone working in this in this field and bringing these things together. Because that's you know I I, I was uh, I remember being in the the gym about sort of five years ago and starting to think yeah this is things are going to get tough and sort of thinking right well that's why I'm here really it's not to it's not to like look good it's to it, it's to actually make myself fit enough to <laughs> to deal with the uh the inevitable difficulties that are that are uh, hurtling towards us um and with the likes of Greer and Orloff and um, uh, Kunster as well, who I've I've also had for my podcast. Uh, I, when I found them in 2018, it was a real breath of fresh air because uh, it's such a moderate voice. Um, you know, it, Greer has this wonderful uh, analysis of the the way that we we. Uh, we think about things in the modern era in this part of the world, uh, you know, the sort of broadly kind of Faustian civilization. We either have progress or complete apocalypse, and that there's no there's no room for anything in between. And actually, looking at the the decline of civilizations in the past, it's always been somewhere in between. And yes, that's right. Yeah, that there, there there have been um, examples. There've been examples of civilizations that have managed to avert decline in various ways which is interesting and you know there's a lot of things uh uh that, that a lot of factors that that feed into that but in 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 europe you know that the the uh the pattern generally is uh there's a there's a, a a movement towards unification that's followed by collapse um it's different in places like china uh the chinese civilization as i understand it I, I i don't know don't know it too too intimately but uh chinese civilization seems to be uh able to uh maintain its structural integrity uh, to a greater degree than european uh the european civilizations that have that have come before um which Brings me to your analysis of uh, Taoism and Faustianism, which I, I, I found really, really interesting. So um, for, for those who are unfamiliar and um, uh, my previous podcast with Don Michael Greer, we go into this, that Faustian civilization is what the German historical theorist Oswald Spengler uh, referred to as our uh, you know, modern Western civilization, beginning from the, uh, the, after the end of the Roman Empire and uh, we're now in its declining phase. Um, and, and your perspective is that that Taoism has something to contribute to the uh, the the ongoing um, uh, the, the 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 process of Faustian civilization in its current phase. Is that right? Um, I believe that personally, one of to to address one of the things you just raised one of the contributing factors to the long-lived uh, trait or you know the survivability of chinese civilization or broader chinese and pan-asiatic cultures is the fact that they're heavily influenced first by uh, Taoism, mm -hmm. as communicated by lao tzu and later by you know the, the sort of like strict uh legalism and ritualistic observance of confucius um i'm not actually convinced that that Faustian civilization or Faustian culture is going to benefit from you know a major infusion of Taoist thought. Mm -hmm. If anything, what it's going to do is it will it will give people who can recognize um, the the next few decades of what's coming for Faustian culture and the Faustian civilization. It'll give them an alternative set of mental tools to navigate the collapse. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. But as for um, I agree uh, with. Spengler's diagnosis that Western civilization, Faustian civilization in general, is headed for its final decline. 
Um, and by that, I don't mean anything so scary as, you know, like a, a, com a complete collapse of civilization, but just its metamorphosis into a different form that may or may not be recognizable to people alive now. Yes, yes. There's, there's, so there's, there's two threads I think I want to pick up. Um, one of them, so that this is this is something that, that I can really connect with here because what I notice in the people that I communicate with um, when I talk about these things with them is a, a real discomfort with the, the possibility that actually um, history is just going to carry on like it's always carried on and you know things are going to get some things are going to get better and some things are going to get worse and people will die and people will live and you know babies will be born and there will be tragedies and comedies and <clears throat> all the, the broad spectrum of human experience and that it's not going to turn into a complete mad max kind of free for all you know zombie apocalypse but at the same time it's not going to turn into a wonderful you know anarcho-communist feminist utopia of, of infinite sharing and and polyamory and you know all the other whatever whatever it is that, that, that the individual person values you know sort of thing. yeah i think there was if i hate to interrupt but yeah there's uh, when when you say stuff like that when you describe that um the the only thing that springs to mind is uh what some people in this community have called a luxury space communism yes, which, that's right. yes. Which basically what star trek is it's a post-scarcity utopia yes. and everyone seems to have forgotten along the way that the point of utopia is it's a place that doesn't exist mm. that's what it means in greek um so yeah luxury space communism and if we can't have luxury space communism we're basically headed for like you know a desert wasteland or mad max um, there is a very curious, um, deliberate, or maybe uh, unconscious inability to envision a world which, or, or a, a timeline that doesn't end in one of those two states. You know, there's no middle ground. Yeah. And that's, that's particularly interesting. And I believe, uh, I personally believe that this is a, a worldview that is very unique to Western culture and Faustian civilization, mm. that, that, that the, the extremes. That, that dichotomy and there no there's no conception of a middle way and that I think is where Taoism and uh, a Taoist worldview actually is very beneficial because if anything it is it's all about seeking that middle path mm. Mm, absolutely yeah uh, this was um, actually an idea that was first first brought to my attention by the writer John Gray who I have some have some issues with him overall, but uh, I, I did like some of the ideas in his book, Straw Dogs, um, which was inspired by his reading of, of, um, of Taoist philosophy. Uh, and he really takes the, the, the Western idea of progress apart and posits Tao, Dao, his, his, obviously his spin on Taoism, because it, you know, it's always through his lens, but, but th there's something really useful there that I found when I, I came across that book um, in my in my uh, undergraduate degree, um, and I think it is. I think you're absolutely right. It's really useful. Uh, it's a really useful framework, um, and actually, it's one that's surprisingly not so unfamiliar for for a lot of people who are in uh, in in contemporary Faustian civilization. Because actually, there's been a, a massive influx of Taoism uh, and Taoist philosophy um, through. Uh, uh, you know, the introduction of, of certain martial arts practices um, and, and you know, the associated sort of culture and media around that. Um, and of course, through the, you know, the, the diasp diasporic communities. Um, so I, I think that there's, there's, there's something, there's something, there's something really valuable to be taken, taken from that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I would add on that um, in, in the West, especially Taoist, uh, a lot of people in the West, if they do know anything about Taoism, they've been introduced to it through uh, individuals such as Alan Watts, mm. uh, who is a remarkable writer, amazing human being. I wish uh, I wish I could have known him in life, but he has done uh, he has done so much to introduce people in the West in a Western audience 
to you know ideas from Taoism as well as Zen Buddhism. So mm-hmm. if if I can be here and if we can be having this conversation and talking about these things, it's really because of people in that community as well. Mm. Mm. Yes, yes, absolutely. What do you think is the 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 current situation like in places like China? Because I, I understand you're you're of Chinese origin, a Chinese American, is that right? Um, I'm Jen- I'm actually Chinese Malaysian. So oh. I'm living I'm living in Malaysia. I'm working in Malaysia. I'm currently visiting my mother, who lives on the east coast. But we are from Malaysia. I'm not so sure if many people in the audience know where that is. It is a tiny Southeast Asian peninsula. And uh, we are, yes, we are of Han Chinese origin. So my family has been in China for about four generations. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we've been in Malaysia for four generations before that we were all in China. Yes, Uh, uh, one of my um, dear friends from university was a uh, uh, a guy of Indian origin, Indian Malaysian uh, from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, that's where i'm from fantastic right yeah so um yeah very very good friend of mine i'll have to send him this uh this recording um but but um I, I, yeah i'm i'm curious do you do you know what the the, the current situation is like in china are, are the chinese people and you know also in 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 the malaysian communities as well are they being um heavily influenced by say the kind of the ideas of faustian civilization the ideas of infinite progress and this sort of thing there's two answers to that. And again, all this is purely subjective. I, I don't claim to, you know, speak for uh, 1.4 billion people. Uh, it's probably more than that now. But from, the, from what I can see, I think that at a very superficial level, the immediate answer is yes, especially after, you know, uh, everything that happened with, with Maoism and uh, the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, once once the country opened to liberalism and a free market economy, there has been a, a very violent shift, a very violent move towards that and embracing, you know, the, the benefits and the luxuries and the fruits of Faustian civilization, which we have to admit is very impressive. It's undeniably impressive. It's, I think, created the, the largest net amount of uh, human comfort and prosperity in the world so there so um it's true not just of people in the mainland but also the chinese diaspora worldwide you know it when when things are good make the most of it but that's just on the surface level i think at a deeper level uh, especially in the mainland um there are still people who remember how bad things could get and we have to remember that things like capitalism and communism as they are currently understood are ultimately ideologies born of the Faustian mindset. Mm. So when you when you consider that the utopia or the visions of utopia offered by the free market and of uh, the socialist state, they are they are foreign to the Chinese or to the Taoist mindset and to the Taoist worldview. They are very noticeably foreign. They're you know they're foreign transplants. So they might take, but you know when you remove the material or the physical infrastructure that enables it or makes it possible, I do believe that people, especially in the mainland, will go back to their what they know, mm. to their roots. And that would be the Taoist and Confucian um, way of life. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so as you, as you point out, you know, there's, there's a, a, within China alone, there are you know, possibly 1.4 billion people now. So there, there are... As I understand, there are actually vast areas where um, probably the way of life hasn't changed that much since the, you know, um, the the arrival of of industrial technology. Uh, I, I wouldn't know. If, I've never been to China, so I wouldn't know. But I'd imagine that there's still a you know a fair number of communities that are still you know farming and doing the things that they've been doing for a number of generations. You'd be right. Yes. Um, what, what people don't really understand about China is that China may be a very populous country, but the vast majority of that population, something like 60 or 70 percent, live near the coast. So near the floodplains of the Yangtze going mm. on to the South China Sea. So if you could divide, if you look at if you look at China on a map and if you kind of like bisected it diagonally um, with, you know, with the north, the northeast on one side, uh, sorry, the southeast 
and the south on one side on one half and the northeastern province on the other side which would be uh, where mongolia and xinjiang are 70 percent of people live under that line right. so near beijing shanghai uh, guangzhou that's where 70 percent of the people live in the coastal states um on the other side if as you head you know further inland um, many, many Chinese people are still relatively unexposed to technological civilization. They're still more or less living uh, pastoralist or agrarian lifestyles. Mm, yeah, uh, and, and in in that in that context, actually, um, the the ensuing uh, uh, decline of, of resources. Um, it could actually be a, a massive benefit. I, I would, I would imagine, to be still living in those communities because, um, you know, the people who have the furthest to fall are going to have the hardest time of the the next few decades. Um, and and you know, this is another thing that that I come up against when I talk to to to, to people in in Britain about um, uh, the future of uh, the future of our our society and the ecological situation and the rest of it and people say well you know how can you be so how can you be so um kind of philosophical about this and don't you realize all of these people and you know in in the you know whatever it's called whatever the, the current name for it the third world the developing world whatever it is you know all of these people are going to suffer and i say no we're going to suffer <laughs> we're going to have the hardest time because we've become accustomed and we've become dependent on these technological infrastructures the you know the people in the village that you know maybe they have a phone line at best they're you know they they will be, who knows that there may be other things that 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 other factors that come into play but they're in a probability wise they're in a bit of a better position i'd say to um to deal with what's coming. That's right. Uh, I believe uh, John Michael Greer once said something to the effect of collapse now and avoid the rush. Mm. And if we unpack the logic behind what he said, it's it's not that you should be collapsing now. It's more of like that inner reality and that inner way of perceiving the world where you realize that, okay, if you consciously collapse yourself to a pre-industrial way of thinking, with all the material and uh, physical constraints that that entails, then when when modern or industrial civilization inevitably does collapse, you won't have very far to fall. So yeah. like you say, people who are accustomed to the, the material comforts, the creature comforts and the luxury of living in a modernized, industrialized first world nation, when, when, when the crunch does come, it is going to be a massive, culture shock it is going to be a massive psychic shock i would not be surprised if some people are driven to suicide when mm. it happens um whereas people who you know like the amish for example or people living in in the in uh the malaysian countryside people who are uh rural farmers rice farmers in Kada, they are going to just think oh well okay that kind of sucks for the city folk but life goes on mm. life goes on and, and there's something very powerful and there's very something very powerful to be said about that way of seeing the world, knowing that knowing that this is going to happen and no, we can't stop it. No, we can't bargain with it or negotiate with it. It is something that will happen within many of our lifetimes, within our children's lifetimes. OK, how do we respond to it? Yes. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the notion of just being accustomed to you know, uh, living with less, living with less luxury, um, and uh, 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 fewer of the kind of technological gugles that we we make use of and buy each other at Christmas and that sort of thing. Um, it is a, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's materially maybe less comfortable, but in a spiritual sense, there's 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 a great deal of satisfaction to be gained from it. You know, I've I've had the experience of living uh, in a community of um, or staying in a community of people who pretty much have eliminated most fossil fuel dependent things from their way of life. Uh, you know, they they might have they've got solar panels and that sort of thing, um, limited amount of electricity, but 
um, most of the other things they do by hand. And um, it, it's it's hard work. It's hard work. But then, you know, uh, hard work makes the body and mind stronger anyway. Um, and this is this is a an, another aspect of your your uh, your writing that your your series of meditations, which I've been really enjoying, um, about you know training. What is the like, what's the what's the phrase you use? Train training yourself to be fast stronger faster and harder to kill is that right yes that's right yeah it's brilliant what a, what a, what a fantastic slogan i, I can uh, i could put that up on my wall actually because that's exactly what i feel like <laughs> that's what that's what was driving me forward and and helping other people to be the same um and and yeah yeah what, what would be your 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 recommendation uh for people getting started on this uh this process well, Luke, um, I, I hate to say stuff like this because it, it's never going to be original. I will be the first to admit it. None of my ideas are ever truly original. Uh, it's really just an amalgamation of things I've seen, things I've read, things I've heard from other people. So don't take this from me. This is, this is a synthesis of what I've heard and digested, and now I'm relaying it to you know the people who do follow my writing. Um, we, we know that the world is headed for some pretty tough times. And yes, we should be training, especially so when things are still good, when the sun is still shining, when you know electricity is still relatively cheap. We should be training to be stronger, harder, str stronger, faster, and harder to kill. And there's many ways. There's, there's, the, there's the external training that you can do but there's also the internal practice, the contemplation and the meditation and the, in, and the acceptance of certain realities that has to happen on the inside in order to be a fully integrated person who's ready for the collapse of, well, not ready, but who can navigate the ongoing collapse of industrial civilization. And some of these are going to be very obvious. They're going to be quite cliche. And some of them may not have occurred to some of you gentle listeners. Um, a big one would, of course, be physical culture. Uh, we see this a lot in on Instagram, on social media right now. It's there is a there is an ongoing zeitgeist that you know we should be getting a lot of sun, eating well, lots of nutrition, uh, eating a kind of a paleolithic diet in accordance with uh, how what the human body is best adapted for. Uh, you should be you know training physically, uh, doing uh, lifting weights, running, getting a lot of cardio and movement in, but. Aside from that, there's also the there's the inner training, and that is a little bit harder for people sometimes. It's easy to hit the gym five, six times a week. It, it's fun. Everyone likes that. What is not so easy is making the changes to the the changes to the frames of mind and the habits of thought that you know you can be thoroughly modern on the inside while appearing to be quite barbaric um, and with a little asterisk on it on the outside. And that's the thing. If you see someone like that, then that person is at best a role playing. He's LARPing, but he hasn't truly understood what it actually means to be ready for the reality of the future we're about to inhabit. Um, certain things like, okay, can you, um, what, what do you actually need to be comfortable? And asking, what is the definition of a good life? What does a good life actually look like to you? And these are questions that may seem absurd. They are very self-evident to a lot of people, but that's the problem. They're not self-evident. And the more you actually ask yourself these questions, what do I need? What do I actually want? No, what do I really want? The more you ask yourself these questions, the more you begin to realize that the answers that we have given ourselves as a society are very, very flimsy, almost cartoonish answers that have no bearing whatsoever to reality. They have no relation to reality at all. They are imprinted on us by advertising, corporate culture, social media, and societal norms and expectations. Mm. Things like, okay, how big of a house do you need? What do you think of food? What about water? What about clothing? What about consumerism? What about transport? What is the role of schooling? What is education for? Should we even be investing in education? These are all things that we hold as self-evident, but they're not. And that 
And questioning these things and formulating your own answer to all of these deceptively simple questions constitutes a big part of the internal training, not just the physical training. Hmm. Hmm. You, you described uh, modernity as nothing new uh, or something to that effect, that um, modernity has been around before and modernity is actually something that, that kind of seduces a culture, is that right? Yes, I believe I said that in my most recent post. That's very interesting. What, 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 how would you define modernity? Uh, okay. Let's, let's try. Please bear with me. The, when I say modernity is nothing new, I don't refer to a specific time or place. Instead, when I refer to modernity, I refer to a habit of thought or a way of regarding the world uh, in which the world ceases to be a place full of mystery and wonder and gods and spirits, and instead becomes this very sterile, and desacralized space that eventually takes on the function of a mechanism. So the more you see the world as a machine or as a mechanism, the more modern you are. I'm very well aware that this definition will not satisfy a lot of people. Feel free to disagree with me on this. But that to me, when, when you actually begin to define modernity as such, you begin to see how what we're experiencing right now is really nothing new. And this fits in very well with uh, Spengler's theory of the life cycle of civilizations, that at some point, a culture is going to mature, and at that point, it begins its senescence or its decay. And um, I do believe that the point at which a society or a culture begins its senescence or its decay is when you can actually, you could replace that with modernity, and it would basically still do the heavy lifting. In terms of the definition of modernity, it's when there it's when the vital force that animates a culture that creates its drive to innovate and explore has basically fizzled out, and there is no longer any mystery or wonder or any desire to explore and interrogate the world, and instead that culture becomes complacent, and you know all the low hanging fruit has been extracted, and now it's kind of coasting on its past accomplishments. And if you accept the definition of modernity, you can begin to see it in many, many places in the past. You can see it in Greek culture. You can see it with the collapse of the Roman Empire. You see it with the various uh, South American uh, civilizations, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the Toltecs, the Incas. You see it in, in China. Uh, I mean, what, what really is the history of Asia but the rise and fall over and over again of different societies? And they almost always collapse when they hit that modern phase, which is when the vital force of the people has been exhausted and the world holds no more mystery for them. It's all just mechanism. It's all about harvesting. It's all about extracting value. Hmm. Mm. Uh, i reminded of um, Camille Paglia's wonderful little uh, speech about the, the process that, that urbanized civilized cultures go through when uh, they they start to play around with things and she's talking about gender sort of gender identity and they start to play around and sort of get very um cosmopolitan and suave and sophisticated and you know that uh everything gets very blurred and um uh uh you know you you get the sort of um the cabaret culture and, and people are having a great time and uh, they, they think that they're really getting somewhere but all it is is that the culture has just become saturated and people have become sufficiently kind of jaded and they've done everything before so they have to get their kicks by kind of doing these um exploring these new new ways of being which is you know it's just is what it is you know I, she wasn't uh, judging that and you know as as a, 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 a feminist herself, um, but she was just pointing out that this is what happens when a culture has kind of kind of exhausted all of its possibilities and is, as you say, kind of coasting on its past glories. 
and circling around the edges are those tribes, those barbarians that still have, you know, still believe in 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 the old the old warrior values. Kind of looking at this place with hungry eyes, like Ooh, look at all these these look at these uh, decadent city folk and all the stuff that they're hoarding that we can just <laughs> swoop in and take. <laughs> um, and and that's you know that that I I have to say that's what I see all around me. Um, uh, not that necessarily that I don't see the barbarians, but I I have no doubt that 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 they are there wherever they they end up coming from. Um, and, um, and, you know, that it seems to me that the, the, um, the response is to just take a little bit of a pinch of salt at the very least with a lot of the ideas that are fl flowing around now with sort of gender fluidity and this kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't have a, a, you know, a judgmental view of anyone who um who feels the need to explore these things at all uh but i would just encourage them to maybe just just check in uh check in with with whether these uh these things are actually viable <laughs> long-term strategies for cultural survival yep yep um i think i think that's that thank you by the way because now i that's i've i've been putting off reading camille paglia for ages and if you after this conversation please do send me the title of that book so i can read it and check it out um that is a fast it's fascinating that you should mention that because i think that it bears it bears mentioning that yes uh something i did leave out is that in modernity one of the recurring traits is that there is that blurring of categories there's um so like you know that 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 relativism that oh okay there's no such thing as truth there a doesn't have to be a things that are this way don't have to be this way and so you go from a culture that's actually just trying to understand and master the physical world to a society that basically has given up on trying to squeeze more out of the world and has basically retreated into this inner world of abstraction and it becomes entirely self-referential mm. and that's what we see it and again you can name any of those many of those are uh, old extinct or ancient civilizations and in their late period that's exactly what happens it becomes complacent there's usually a bloated elite there's an elite class and a priesthood that have basically lost all semblance of you know of reckoning with reality and it's all of, oh, we make the rules. So what we say goes. And they begin to confuse the symbol for the substance. And that's very concerning because and everywhere in the modernized world or the developed world, you see the same thing. People only see the world of appearances, but they don't actually see the reality uh, on which the appearances are built. Yes. Yes. Uh, this causes a, an awful lot of confusion uh, because people are unmoored from the 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 physical reality uh, in which you know all of these things are taking place, and as you say, they become preoccupied with abstractions, and then they try to imprint those abstractions onto reality. And this is something that I was I was talking about with um, uh, the the Stone Age herbalist. Um, uh, who uh, is a fantastic uh, archaeological um, expert uh, and uh, has, has written for, for Man's World a few times as well, uh, which is where I discovered your writing. Um, and it, we were talking about the, the kind of the uh, quote-unquote wokeification of archaeology um, and anthropology. And, um, uh, and, and, you know, that the... the, the the assault on the concept of difference is difference is is very scary and uncomfortable for for modernized people and so the idea that um men and women are different and have had historically speaking generally speaking very different roles is very uncomfortable so you kind of you look for ways to dodge around it and dance around it and make it look like actually those differences are 
pretty much arbitrary and socially constructed and <laughs> yes that that phrase keeps popping up x or y is a social construct yeah. well no not really um i would say yes a lot of things that we we claim our social constructs are social constructs and at the root of it all you know many things or names we give to things in reality are socially constructed in that they don't exist unless humans say they exist so that is true but you know to sincerely believe that everything is ultimately a social or human construct is is absurd mm. i can hit you with a rock right now and you know nothing that you say no, no philosophy no anthropology or anything is going to change the fact that i'm a man hitting another man with a rock and that's the reality mm. Mm. yeah i i was talking with um uh, with a chap recently a very nice guy um uh who's, who's sort of very much kind of leaning towards the feminist marxist view uh and we were debating things and he made the claim that um uh historical studies show that a third of a third of Viking warriors were women. And I was went, no, they weren't. <laughs> so what are you talking about? So look it up. Actually, no one's made that claim. But um, the claims that they have made have been based around, you know, the, the, these very tenuous interpretations of grave goods and of bone material. But it does fit in with a kind of, you know, um, with the comic book culture and the Hollywood culture and, the, you know, the video game culture that we've all grown up with of, of you know, Xena Warrior Princess and, and um, Lara Croft and everything. And that, that's fine. I mean, it's fiction. It's why not? You know, um, martial arts films have one single guy like beating the crap out of 80 guys in one go. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not very realistic, but it's, it's fun and it's cool. But I mean, the the point is when people start to uh, start to confuse these things with reality, and then they start to actually kind of uh, uh, um, rewrite history um, to fit an ideological agenda. That's when it, we get peak modernity. It's not just like we're modern now, but everyone always was modern. And then you get the fantastic example recently of the um, the the Viking warrior who was assigned the status of being non-binary which i found absolutely hilarious yeah it it is it really does beggar belief it simply beggars belief that we have hit we have reached a point where a biological male can who you know who can decide that oh um i'm a woman and if you disagree with me you are transphobic you're a bigot and not only do you have to acknowledge me as a woman you have to allow me to compete against biological females in combat sports and um oh please ignore the fact that i have you know uh, i have all this andro uh, all this androgen all this testosterone in me that gives me an undeniable upper body strength advantage bone mass advantage over this woman and oh if i you know beat the shit out of her you can't say anything because it's women beating other women wink wink i'm a woman didn't you know that yeah yeah, um, I'm sorry, but but when stuff like that really does boil my blood, it beggars belief. I um, I found it outrageous that in the recent Olympics, a biological male was allowed to compete in weightlifting against biological females. Yeah, that should never happen. I am not saying this before people start sharpening their knives and pitchforks. I am not saying that trans men and women should not be allowed in sport. They should be given their own category. They should not be allowed to compete in the same categories as biological males and females. It is simply not the way to go about things. It's fascinating, actually, because it, in fact, uh, it confers advantages in both ways, because you have, um, uh, if, what is it, uh, male to female, male to female transgender uh, athletes obviously have the advantage of, of basically having been men and still actually in biologically literal sense are still men um and you know they have all of the advantages as you say of bone mass and okay you know maybe they have to take hormones which reduces their testosterone but you know uh, 
for the first, at least for the first five years or so, they have an enormous advice. I was, I remember hearing an interview with a, a female mixed martial artist uh, who went up against a trans fighter. Uh, and she said, it, it, I've never experienced anything like that. It was like being hit by a train. Um, and, and, and on the other hand, actually you get uh, female to male transgender athletes they have they they actually can have a, a an unfair advantage because they've they're allowed to take testosterone <laughs> so it's just as you say yeah make a separate category sure um but you know that the idea that and then you know once you get into the the question of of um women being uh, uh sorry what is it uh, yeah male to female transgender prisoners being then set loose in women's prisons, which has been happening quite a bit here in the UK. It's happened a, a handful of times at least and will continue if the legislation doesn't get fixed. Um, and perpetrating awful crimes against the women in the prisons. And there's an argument to say that prisons should be reformed in general um, to, to keep prisoners safe of all sex, of both sexes. That's fine. But don't give people uh, a loophole. Don't give men a loophole by which they can get out of get out of um, you know the 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 harsh environment of a men's prison and then start abusing women in the women's prison. I mean that's just a, that's just insane. I mean it, I mean really our, our culture has really completely lost its shit if this is actually on the table and people are people are in denial about it. You know, I tell people about this and, you know, people sort of progressive lefty types and they they just don't, they don't know that's not happening. It's like, yes, it is. I can show you the evidence. It, it it doesn't even, yeah. We don't even have to look at prisons. We can even look in schools at at certain schools where uh, where biological males are allowed into the same bathrooms and changing rooms as the female students you see a tremendous increase in the incidences of rape and sexual assault. Why? But, but of course, this news gets suppressed because it, it's, it's a very unpleasant truth and people would rather have comforting lies over uncomfortable truths. And that's the way it's, and that's the, that's the culture we live in right now. Yes, completely. Yeah. Um, the process of decline seems to involve uh, uh, an absolute uh, uh, detachment from from objective reality, um, and it's 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 interesting because that's that's another a sort of another aspect of this mental training that that you talk about is, I think the the mental training to actually just maintain one's own integrity the structural integrity of your own you know your own embodied experience of reality in the face of just everyone around you almost everyone around you just seemingly losing all connection with it isn't it it's it's easy to be swept away in these times you know, and I think this goes, it's it's not even a, a left wing or woke or progressive phenomenon, even on the more conservative or traditionalist or so-called right wing side of the spectrum. There's all kinds of there's all kinds of bad actors and misinformation going around about the way the world used to be mm. and the way the world is right now yes. and the way the world should be. So the question for mental training is really like what you said, how to preserve the structural integrity of your own person, your ideas. And every way of phrasing it is, you may have physical sovereignty, but intellectually and spiritually, are you sovereign? And the answer for the overwhelming number of people on the earth is no, people are not mentally and so spiritually sovereign. And because of that, their minds can get hijacked and co-opted into believing all sorts of, of nonsense. You know, there's just different flavors of nonsense. There's left-wing nonsense, there's right-wing nonsense, there's ultra-progressive nonsense, there's traditionalist nonsense. Um, it, you know, and, and because of that, if your mind is filled with nonsense, how can you ever actually see the world as it is and begin to take steps to prepare for, the, for things that are about to happen? The answer is you don't because you're so busy, you're enmeshed in the discourse that you don't see reality. 
And that's where we live right now. We live in a world of discourse and not in the real world. At least most of us do. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely noticed this tendency with, um, with right-wingers and traditionalists as well, um, valorizing a past that never was, you know, uh, whatever part, whatever, at, whatever sort of the, the chosen time period is, you know, um, uh, is this sort of fantasy projections and also fantasy projections about the future. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a, yeah, that there's, there's some, there's some danger there in, you know, I, I guess you could call it kind of archaeo futurism sort of, you know, that, Again, it, it's sort of like the the luxury luxury space communism that you were you were referring to earlier, um, except it's like the you know the the right wing version of that or the alt right version of that, like you know the luxury I don't know luxury space Vikings or I don't know whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's one vision of archaeo futurism, and and the rest is you know you if you spend as much time as I do on social media, which I really should reduce, you also get this opposite, this whole return, you know, with the return to Europa, return to tradition. Mm -hmm. And they have all these pictures of Greek statues and of the gates of Vienna and, you know, uh, blonde, blue eyed women in wheat fields wearing nice little sundresses. That world mm, probably has never existed. Mm -hmm. And if it did, the reality of inhabiting that world is very different from the idealized portrait of the past that people think. Yes, you can have your Aryan waifu in a wheat field, sure, but do you deserve it? Can you do the work for it? Do you even know how to farm? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't ask for the farmer with cute wife lifestyle of tradition without actually, you know, being a man of tradition who can create, who can live that lifestyle. And most people who are doing that, like I said, are just LARPing. They, it's all for the internet. It's all optics. These people probably do not have the physical strength or technical skills needed to subsist profitably off the land. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no shame in saying that I don't know how to farm. I mean, for God's sake, I don't know how to farm. My grandparents were farmers. I don't know how to farm. But do you see me LARPing and pretending that that's who I am? No. The problem is a lot of people do. Mm, mm, yeah. It, 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 it's it's fascinating it's like the the um the machine has found its own way of tapping into the 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 algorithms to to promote an ideal that's, that's luring people back into the machine um and back into the the sort of you know the fantasy world with the guise of an escape from it um, so in a sense, like the, the luxury space communists, at least there's something more, uh, or the Elon Musk types or whatever, at least there's something more consistent about that, whereas the, the sort of return with, a, with a, a V instead of a U, that sort of return to Europa, you know, that kind of, um, kind of quasi, quasi fashy kind of traditionalist, um, um, uh, aesthetic it, it's yeah it's just another it's just another aesthetic uh in the you know in the in the in the catalog of of um of empty vacuous images to 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 feed more data mining and <laughs> you know it's like it's it's an identity and that's kind of my problem with modernity as we are currently experiencing it all identities have been dissolved and sublimated into these outfits, these categories. So it's kind of like you go into a mall and instead of buying, uh, buying clothing and outfits, you're just buying uh, traits, you're buying beliefs, you're buying values, you're buying philosophies, and you're throwing all them all together and you're expected to come with a person like, oh, this is who I am. And that's why you get this, these absurdities where you have these people coming up overnight, making the switch to deciding that we want to be conservatives, we want to be, tra we want to be trad people, we want to be quasi fashy And all it is, it's, it's, it's all about the appearance. And if it's all about the appearance with nothing to back it up, then in, in my book, that is a sham. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
which which has the corollary of saying that if any the only people I respect at this point would be the Amish and the Mennonites because they don't just they don't they're not even on the internet mm. they're they're busy living the reality they're busy living the, that experience and they're as a result there's no time for them to be pretending online or posturing and you know posting about themselves because they're busy actually living it and if you've got time to be posting about it uh, posting pictures of wheat fields and greek statues on the internet you could be spending some time learning how to grow herbs or starting an herb garden or lifting weights that's that's just the way i see it yeah yeah absolutely yeah no it, it's um it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting response to modernity but it's a response that just uh, entrenches it more and as you say um you know uh leads one back into the kind of dopamine trap of of modern technology um and with an you know with a lot of fetishism and a lot of uh a lot of potential for really uh, quite unwholesome ideas to spread within it as well you know i see a lot of um i, I see you know as much kind of ridiculous identity politics obviously on the right as i do on the left um now and you know sort of hanging around in the corners of twitter right that i do uh, <laughs> as, <coughs> as you say i could probably spend less time on social media too but hey there we go um that you do see that the most it's just obnoxious nonsense uh sort of you know uh fantasy kind of uh the racialist fantasies and stuff like that um which you know it's just there's i just I, I just don't think are very helpful um aside from the you know obvious obviously that part of it i think is sort of it's a, a a troll's response to that which is you know considered to be absolutely beyond the pale and shocking in our culture um uh but again that's just you know falling back into the trap of the of the same culture really yeah yeah that does seem to be the case i do not disagree with you on any of that mm. so alex where can we find your newsletter online so that we can become better barbarians ourselves you can find me on Substack at leong.substack.com. That's L-E-O-N-G dot substack.com. And that would be for my weekly newsletters. And uh, that's my long form writing. I do post shorter writings that may or may not be related to my newsletters on Instagram at Metabro. And that's on Instagram, M-E-T-A-B-R-O-H. Excellent. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Alex, and I look forward to catching up again sometime soon. Likewise, Luke. That was a very enjoyable conversation. Thank you. And I look forward to speaking with you real soon. Bye.